Good morning. It's great to see everyone here this morning. Really fast, show off your smile to someone, preferably the person to your right and to your left. Go. All right, let's get the service started with a couple of announcements. Now, if you are visiting this morning, you get to do something fun, you get to grab that little sheet of paper at the end of your pew, on both ends hopefully, and just fill that out so we can have a record of your visit, and then you'll put it in the offering plate when it comes your way. Um, now there is an announcement that is not in the bulletin, and um, the handsome Chris Dempsey will make that announcement real quick, so come on up here. Good morning. I uh, just want to remind everyone that a copy of the nomination committee's uh, report is in the front of the church. If you haven't received that, please pick one up and review that. And if your name has been omitted and there's a committee that you wanted to serve on, please let one of the committee members know uh, because we did not put people on committees unless they submitted the forms to us. So just please let us know about that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. Okay, open up your bulletins, look on with me. Tonight, make sure that you come back um, at six o'clock. We will not be meeting in here. We will be meeting in the CMC. Uh, it will be financial aid night for all of our sophomores and our juniors and seniors to come in and um, fill all that out. And someone from JSU will be here to assist them with that. But also, we're asking um, that it just be a fellowship night, too, so everyone can come and eat, and I like that idea. So we're asking that you bring some snacks tonight for our guests and for our, us Williamites, um, and that will be at 6 o'clock tonight. And if you have a laptop that you would like to have someone, you know, share it with someone, please bring that as well to help out. Um, make sure you come back Wednesday for course supper which is at 5 30 and the menus there in the bulletin and then we have our regular activities at 6 30 our bible studies um valentine banquet is next sunday night and you can notice in your bulletin there's an insert read the information on it and get your name on that and turned in but also make sure you read at the bottom how to turn that in and how not to turn it in you don't want to have cash because then it gets kind of lost and confusing so just read that information there that's next sunday night um, and then one last announcement that's not in the bulletin. Mike and Sharonda need to meet with any of you senior adults that want to meet in the choir room after the service this morning, right after the service, okay? And there's other things to read about. Make sure that you do. There's some other announcements on the back as well that I didn't hit on, so read, okay? And now it's time for you to find some Williams loving. It'll be given out. I will be giving out some loving if you need some. Uh, hugs, free hugs and kisses and shake, a shaking of hands. So let's go. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. I have just, uh, I guess just one, uh, well, I have two announcements. I remember one of them now. Um, it's funny how that happens. You forget things when you don't write them down. Isn't that weird? Uh, first thing I want to tell you is next week, if you look at the bottom of your order of worship, next Sunday we will be uh, celebrating Sanford Sunday. I believe this will be the third year we've done that. And also recognizing Martha Stern's Marshall Month of Preaching. Whew. Try saying that really fast, the Martha Stearns Marshall Month of Preaching. Um, that is when we will invite a, a young woman here into our sanctuary to preach next week, and Dory Burnett will be with us. You may remember Dory from last year. 
She came during that time. Dory is a student at Samford. Uh, she's been married since last time, so preaching at Williams uh, has its benefits. And the, yeah, some of you got that. Uh, the last time that she was here, uh, and I'm going to say this this week before she comes next week, right before she got up to preach, I'd asked Dory, I said, well, how many times have you, you had a chance to preach? And she said, oh, uh, once. And her mother looked at me and went, and so uh, she's gotten some, some time under her belt, and I know she appreciates this congregation and our willingness to let her come and share with us and live into her calling. Also, a bit of housekeeping. Um, some of you may have noticed some other church members have this book, and it's called I Am a Church Member. Beginning the first Sunday night of March, uh, we are going to be doing this book together as a church in what I'm going to call the new and renewed members sort of approach to Sunday nights. Uh, some of our deacons, uh, some of them in pair, some of them individually, will be leading some breakout groups with this book. Uh, you'll hear more information about how that goes, but you're going to need this book. And I've got right now about 20 copies back in the foyer, and at the end of the service, Patsy will be back there. You can either buy them, they're only five bucks, or you can check them out from us, but uh, let me encourage you to do that. If you don't normally come on Sunday evenings, if you're not normally a part of, say, a Sunday school class, which, by the way, we have one for you, and we would love to see you there, um, make, make time, make an effort to be a part of this. Uh, this book is not very big, and most of the pages you see in here are those filler pages that tell you where it's published and all that jazz, so don't be intimidated by the size of this book. Uh, it's going to be a very easy, very easy time, but I think with some very deep uh, discussions that will mean a lot to us as a church family and to you as a church member. So... Um, I'm kind of rambling on because I didn't write anything down about this, but um, I do. Let me encourage you: pick up a book, flip through it, and I think you'll find out that this will be a good thing for us to do together, beginning the first Sunday night in March. Uh, as we have come now to this time, though, of worship, as we join our hearts and minds together, let us do so with a word of prayer. Great God, we thank you, Lord, just for all the ways that you bless us. Lord, all the ways that you lead us. And Lord, this morning as we've come together for worship, as we see all these faces, our friends, our family, our community members, faces we know, faces that may be new to us, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit be in this place with us, that you help us, Lord, to be servants to one another, show our love for you as we love each other. And Lord, in this time of worship, may we do that. May we lift our hearts up to you, our concerns, our cares. And lift up those, Lord, who are not here, who cannot be with us. Those who are hurting, those who are far away. So Holy Spirit, be with us in this time of worship. May you give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to love, hands and feet, Lord, to do your will. In the name of Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. I will be reading from Mark 1, 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her hand and lifted her. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his, his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone's searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message 
in their synagogues and casting out demons. Seems like all I could see was the struggle Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past Bound up in shackles of all my faith Wondering how long is this going to last? Then you look at this prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight. It's already been won. I am redeemed. Set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain. Now I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. Oh. Life, I have been called unworthy. Named by the voice of my shame and regret. But then I hear you whisper, child, lift up your head. And I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. I am redeemed You set me free So I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain Now I'm not who I used to be Because I don't have to be The old man inside of me Cause his day is long dead and gone Because I've got a new name A new life, I'm not the same And a hope that will carry me home I am redeemed You set me free So I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain Now I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed You set me free So I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain I'm not who I used to be Oh God, I'm not who I used to be Jesus, I'm not who I used to be I am Thank God redeemed. I love to hear Chris sing. But did y'all hear the words? 
what he said. Wow. First hymn this morning is 300. I tell the world I'm a Christian. I sing all, uh, most stanzas of this song. Please stand. Our next hymn this morning is hymn number 508. I'll sing the wondrous story. I'll sing the first, second, and four stanzas.
How are y'all this morning? Good. Good. Yeah, what, what's going on this week? Y'all know what's going on this week? It's not really a holiday, but my goodness, if you go out to the restaurants, you'd think it's a holiday. Valentine's, Valentine's Day. <laughs> when we talk about Valentine's Day, what is the main theme of Valentine's Day? What do you see all over the place? What do you see? Hearts. Hearts. And what do, when we see a heart, what do we think of? Oh, come on. What, when <laughs> your parents probably tell you this all the time, I blank you. Love. What, love, yeah. When you see it, that's what, that's what it's all. They all call it the, the day of love is what it's called. Well, I want to talk to you a little, a little bit different about it because you're going to see, you see things like this all the time, right? You'll see this. That's what you see, especially when you walk in the front doors of Walmart or Dollar General. I saw that thing. I know. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to use it multiple times. Um, <laughs> Dollar Tree, anywhere you walk in, you'll see all these decorations. It's got hearts everywhere. But I want you to think about it. I want you to see, and I don't have one in there, but I want you to see if you can imagine a cross right in the middle of that heart. When I say a cross, what do you, what, am I talking about a cross? Who, is that, who does that represent? Jesus. Jesus. What did Jesus do for us on that cross? Yeah. He died for us. And then of course rose again so that one you know one day that we can if we choose to follow him we can live with him and to me when you think you know y'all we listen to stories and fairy tales and all you girls are all about um probably princess stories and things but one of the things um we think about an act of true love to me the truest act of love that has ever been given has been god giving his son jesus christ to die on that cross for us. And I know it's not there, but anytime you see a heart, I want you to, I want you to think about that. And I'm going to give you a heart today, and I'm going to give you something else too. It's not candy, Mr. Mike's. <laughs> not that. But in the middle of this heart, and I've got all different colors because, you know, we always see pink and purple and red. Yes, Abby helped me make these this morning. Um, but hearts are, whatever our heart what we have inside, it's not really the color that they put out there. But, I've written a verse on here, and if you pay attention in the middle of the verse, this is John 3.16, and that's a verse that I know we, we learn all the time, and we talked about this Wednesday night in um, service upstairs, but John 3.16, this is what it says, and if y'all want to help me quote it, adults and everybody that knows it, you go right ahead. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should perish but have everlasting life. And on here... It says eternal life, but eternal life and everlasting, that means the same thing. But if you look right down the middle, it spells out Valentine. And what do we know about Valentine's Day? What did I say it was? The day of what? Love. Love. God so loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross for us. So if you ever have anybody ask you, what's a true act of love? The true act of love is God sending his son to die for us so that we could live with him eternally. So I'm going to give each of you one of these. And I'm also going to give you this you can uh, use to color later or this week or sometime. It's got John it's talks about Jesus. It's holding up Jesus in the heart and it says John 3.16 on it. And I hope that any time that you see a heart that you will remember that. Just like your parents love you God loves you so much. He loves all of us so much. Okay? So can we pray real quick and then I'll hand these to you and then we'll go to the children's church. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for you and for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to us and showing us that true act of love. But we just pray that you would help us to see others and show true acts of love to other people as we are surrounded by them each day. We love you and ask all these things in your name. Amen. All right. And you got a sheet. Y'all can grab it. You want to here, give everybody a heart, friend. hymn this morning is hymn number 364 my jesus i love thee we'll sing the first second and fourth stanzas please stand as we sing
this world. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. You know, after so many weeks of just dreary, cold weather, when we wake up this weekend to days like this, it reminds me of perhaps prophetic words from Mr. Brad Paisley. Uh, there ain't nothing that'll test your faith like a long sermon on a pretty Sunday. And so uh, let's see how much our faith get tested today, shall we? Uh, as you're turning in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, some of you have asked, no, I did not forget my tie this morning. I knew Chris was going to sing, and he's always looked so cool. I just wanted to... <laughs> thanks, Chris, by the way. Man, thanks. That was awesome. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll be reading verses 16 through 23. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 9, we'll pick up there in verse 16. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting. For an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I have become as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those under the law, outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I might, may share in its blessings. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Would you pray with me? Lord, this morning we ask God for ears to hear. Ears that hear your words and not mine. Words that stir us to something more, that challenge us, that provoke us to your kingdom's work. Holy Spirit, be with us. Speak to us. And may we listen. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What does it mean to proclaim the gospel? Is it a public pronouncement, an act of standing before a crowd of others and speaking about the great depths of the divine mystery, hoping others will hear and be convinced that something maybe within them or something outside of them has to change? I've always wondered, how does that work when all the people in the room are pretty much the same or at least pretty close to it? What does it mean to proclaim the gospel? Is it an audacious act of confrontation wherein one greets a stranger with a list of perfectly rehearsed reasons for seeing things his or her way? A list of Bible verses tailored for any so-called sinner to prove their need for repentance and reformation. What does it mean to proclaim the gospel? Is it standing on street corners with posters and picket signs blaring through a bullhorn that the coming judgment of an angry God is on its way? Is it taking a stand for what you believe or drawing a line in the sand and saying, this is as far as I go and you can come no farther? Is it sticking your chest out, and wagging your finger and declaring that this world is going to hell in a handbasket if it doesn't get with you and get in line with your way of thinking? Is it choosing sides and thus declaring it's us versus them? What does it mean to proclaim the gospel? 
Oh, is it loving the sinner but hating the sin? All the while ignoring the present sin in our own lives and chalking it up to, well, that's just the way I am. That's just the way I was raised. It's really not that bad. Is it turning a microscope onto the private lives of others, pointing out their moral failings as in need of reformation, since such shortcomings are far greater or at least less acceptable than our own shortcomings? Is it looking through the telescope of the television and commenting on the horrendous acts of those who claim other faiths, then turning around and saying, ours is superior, ours is better, because we would never do anything like that, Never mind the Crusades, the Inquisitions, the atrocities during the colonizations, colonization of the Americas, or the slave trade. Is it sharing stories and pictures on social media with captions like, click like if you believe this? What does it mean to proclaim the gospel? Now I suppose that question may be a bit difficult to answer in a time when the forms of communication available to us are nearly as numerous as the people doing the communicating. So maybe we ought to ask it differently. Rather than say, what does it mean to proclaim the gospel? We ought to mean, what, is it, what does it mean to share the gospel? Some of you know what I'm talking about. When you click that little button that says share, and then everybody else gets to see it. What does it mean to tweet the gospel? To Snapchat the gospel? What does it mean to text the gospel, to vine the gospel? Can we put a hashtag on the gospel? Maybe the problem is with the method. However, I doubt the answer is going to be found in contemporary substitute forms of communication. What does it mean to proclaim the gospel? In the text before us this morning that we've read from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Paul makes it pretty clear that proclaiming the gospel is pretty important. He says in verse 16, read those words, If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me. And woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. He calls this proclamation an obligation and says, Woe if I don't do it. Now, for those of us from a different era, woe means, um, uh, oh boy, if I don't do it. They're pretty stout words. But what does Paul mean still when he says, proclaim the gospel? It's still kind of foggy. Now, I suppose we could flip through the New Testament, look back over the storied accounts of Paul's ministry. We could look through the writings of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles or the letters that bear Paul's name, some written by him, some written by others. We could point to the times when Paul stood before large crowds of people and made these grand pronouncements about the mysteries of God and Christ, and we could say, that's what it means to proclaim the gospel. But to simply look at the apostles' preaching means we'd have to also see where his preaching failed. We'd have to look there in Athens at the Areopagus where Paul, despite his best efforts, despite his eloquence and his well-crafted arguments, was not successful. We'd have to look at the almost funny incident when Paul is preaching to a packed house and he's so dry and boring that a man named Eutychus falls out the window because he fell asleep. We'd have to see, if we just point to Paul's preaching, that there's some pretty big holes. Besides all of that, to point to Paul's public proclamations and declare them as exemplary in the way you proclaim the gospel is to relegate gospel proclamation to gatherings like this one where a single individual stands in front of a gathered group and proclaims the gospel. Such an understanding crams gospel proclamation into a single sliver of time. It gives all the... the, the responsibility to a single somebody. And then, when it's all said and done, if there's no one standing at the altar, if there's no one making professions of faith, no one asking for baptism or seeking repentance, then we can all chalk it up to the fault of the preacher and his sermons and hope that next week he'll really get them going. If public, ceremonious acts of declaration aren't the only way to proclaim the gospel, then 
What does it mean to proclaim the gospel? Well, let's look at the rest of what Paul has to say in this passage to us. In verses 17 and 18, Paul's basically laying it out there. He's making a case for why he does ministry the way he does. Corinth is a messed up place, and Paul's trying to set them back right, and he has to defend himself a few times. He's writing in those verses to say, this is how I do things. I have no sort of contractual obligation. There's nothing hanging over Paul's head from a hierarchy or some kind of congregational mandate. I think Paul would have made a great Baptist in that sense. Paul proclaims the gospel freely, without allegiances, without drawing lines between us and them. In fact, in verses 20 through 22, Paul says the words we've all probably heard so many times before. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law so that I might win those outside of the law. To the weak, I became weak and that I might win the weak. I have, Paul says, become all things to all people that I might by all means save some. Now let me make something clear. Paul isn't making an argument for being some kind of holy people pleaser. He isn't concerned with making everybody happy. He isn't worried about not hurting people's feelings, which I think if we were honest with ourselves is a particular issue that confronts the church in more ways than we care to confess. Nor is Paul promoting some kind of bait-and-switch evangelism whereby he casually pretends to relate to others and hope to gain their trust before really turning on the gospel swagger in order to bring people over to his way of doing things. I'm afraid both of those misinterpretations, however, of Paul's words have crept their way into the church over the years. We have tried to be all things to all people by coddling those who are afraid of change, by giving lip service to those who hold the power, which is often held in a checkbook, by trying to offer countless programs and events uh, aimed at every imaginable demographic, and perhaps most of all, we've tried every way imaginable to avoid being honest with those within our congregations who create toxic divisions by selfish actions, all so we won't hurt anybody's feelings. I think sometimes we've misheard Jesus. He didn't call us to be peacekeepers. He called us to be peacemakers. And sometimes that's not so pretty. On the other hand, we've decided that the way to reach people is to pretend to be something we're not. There are congregations who have removed words from their church signs. Words like Baptist, Presbyterian, even the word church is gone. They do it all in order to seem less like a religious institution. They've tried every trick from every book to appear relevant. Yet newcomers eventually find that beneath all of that flash, all of that veneer of meaning, is the same old institution that values conformity over acceptance and the love of God. There are congregations whose signs, mission statements, and website headers all say, All are welcome. Yet if someone of a certain persuasion someone of a certain skin color, a socioeconomic, or immigration status should darken the door or, heaven help us, want to join the church. Well, we quickly find out not all are welcome. We tell ourselves we want to bring others to be more like Christ, but too often, I'm afraid, Christians, it looks like we're trying to bring others to a place where they look more like us, whether we are more like Christ or not. So if proclaiming the gospel doesn't always look like preaching, if it's not people-pleasing or bait-and-switch evangelism, then what does it look like? What does it mean to proclaim the gospel? Well, I think the key to unlocking the answer to that question is found in Paul's own words in this text in verse 19. Right there between his importance of proclamation and I have become all things to all people. He says, for though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more of them. This isn't lip service. 
This isn't people pleasing. This isn't bait and switch evangelism. Paul has made himself a slave to all, a servant to all. Paul hasn't merely lowered himself for a moment in hopes to make a few converts that will eventually rise up to look like him. He hasn't changed who he is so that he could talk in the dialect and the tone and the slang of those he's hoping to change. He hasn't watered down or fired up the gospel in the hopes of coaxing or scaring others into believing. He has quite simply, quite powerfully, quite beautifully become a slave to them. He has put himself not above them, but below them in the place of their servant, so that he might know them, really know them, love them, and share life and the gospel with them. And he's done it all, he says, for the sake of the gospel, so that he may share in its blessing. So what does it mean? What does it mean, then, to proclaim the gospel? Well, I think it means what those wonderful words from St. Francis of Assisi said. We preach the gospel always, but we use words only when necessary. It means we take ourselves and make ourselves servants to all, to those we like, those who are like us, those in our community, those who are hurting, those who need our help, but perhaps even most of all, it means we make ourselves servants to those we dislike the most. Those we believe, if we're really honest with ourselves, aren't worthy of Christ's love. As if we're bold enough and ignorant enough to think we are in the first place. Proclaiming the gospel means doing more than just saying we love everybody. It means actually proving it. It means getting over our hang-ups and our hold-ups, letting go of what is truthfully deep down ignorance and hate. It means loving someone without ever judging them, or the way my friend Bob puts it, and I love it, loving them without a hook in it. It means, proclaiming the gospel, means we have to leave this cozy, familiar confines of this building, this community, our self-constructed bubbles of security, and our own ideologies to meet people, God's people, right where they are. And not, not so we can bring them to our level, but so that we can serve them with the love of Jesus Christ, whose outstretched, nail-pierced hands have shown us just how much He already loves us and everyone else, even if we don't. And I'm going to tell you, friends, it's easy. It's easy to ignore our calling to proclaim the gospel this way. It's easy to say it's all up to the preacher. It's all up to his sermon. It's all up to the ministry of the church. It's all up to the persuasiveness of the information I possess. And if people don't buy it, well, that's on them. It ain't on me. It's easy to hide behind proof texts and claim that the Bible says you don't have to congregate with those other people. Can I talk for a minute? That'd be all right. I wish we spent half as much energy loving people as we did trying to find Bible verses not to. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk. No, I ain't going to talk. I don't know if y'all want to hear it. I wish, man, I wish, we would spend a fraction of our energy feeding people as we do worrying about what's happening at the courthouse. I wish we would spend half as much time doing what Jesus has called us to do instead of trying to find ways to keep people away. My God, if we did, man, we'd be a whole lot closer to the kingdom of heaven, I think, instead of taking two steps back every time. So let us proclaim the gospel. Let us proclaim the gospel always and use words only when necessary. Let us proclaim the gospel as we seek to be slaves to all people. Let us proclaim the gospel as we seek to live our lives together with those we might otherwise wish to keep at a distance. Let us proclaim the gospel as we work to put an end to ignorance, hatred, and oppression. Let us proclaim the gospel 
as we strive to end injustice, poverty, human trafficking, and hunger. Let us proclaim the gospel as we work together to bring God's full kingdom to its full reality. Let us work together. Let us proclaim the gospel as Paul proclaimed it, as Christ himself proclaimed it, by taking on the form of a slave. Let us proclaim the gospel. For woe to us if we don't. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Have mercy, Lord, when we spend our time and our energy in anything but proclaiming your gospel. Give us hands and feet, Lord, that do it. Help us, Lord, to walk the walk, to not be content with talking the talk. May your Holy Spirit come. Prick our hearts. Show us, Lord, how you call us to live in the full love of Christ our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is uh, hymn number 284. They'll know we're Christians by our love. Sing the first and second stanzas. Please stand as we sing. go forth from this place, may the world know that you are indeed Christians by the love of Christ that exudes from you and the Holy Spirit that lives within you. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, go with us boldly into this world. We may love others with the full love that you have loved us. Lord, help us. God, help us to show the world that we are Christian, that they will know us by our love. In your name we pray. Amen.